des Menschen zu sprachen, ist in einer Wandlung begriffen, deren Tragweite wir noch nicht erlässt. Begangen. Ich habe mich daher nun entschlossen, mit Polen in der gleichen Sprache zu reden. So it must be asked, what is it that is so seductive about fascism? Why does it periodically see widespread, frenzied support? It's easy to say that only stupid people or brainwashed people or other inferior people can fall for fascism. And yet, otherwise intelligent people throw their support behind it. For instance, Martin Heidegger was widely hailed as one of the most original and influential philosophers of the 20th century. He was also a Nazi, at least for a few years in the early to mid 1930s. What can we make of his seduction by fascist thought? Can we consider his philosophy independently of his early support for fascism? To get the story of Heidegger, and any discussion of Heidegger will have fascism as a backdrop, I spoke with three philosophers, teachers, and Heidegger scholars, Jeremiah Conway, Gods and Radicals writer, Cadmus Herschel, and eco-feminist thinker, Suzanne Claxton. philosopher, born in Meskirch in 1889. He dies in Freiburg, Germany, in 1976. He's a prolific writer and thinker. The German edition of his works runs to about 70 volumes. Very controversial figure. There's no question uh, an involvement with the Nazis, uh, was rector of the University of Freiburg in 1933-34, and really appointed by the Nazis, not directly, but heavily influenced. So what interested me initially, I don't admit it with great pride, is I couldn't understand him. So he was a challenge to me. I read Being in Time, and you'd get flashes of brilliance, but large parts which I just didn't get. Eventually, you know, it's always dangerous to say, but I began to, to a degree, understand them. And I was interested then in, you know, the issues that he was willing to address. They always struck me as extraordinarily basic issues. You know, what is human existence? What does it mean to exist? Uh, issues of death and guilt and on and on and on. Issues of death and guilt. I realized that one of the things that most interested me about the man was the way he thought. So the actual way of thinking that seemed to me for lack of a better term, meditative. And one of the signs of this for me was it was hard for me to read him without my own thinking coming alive. Thinking, coming alive. Thinking, coming alive. So one way that I, I understand uh, an aspect of Heidegger's overall project that stays pretty consistent throughout most of his life is that, you know, uh, there's this uh, common assumption. We, we get it from, from folks like Descartes and then, and then Kant, but now it's so ingrained in us we don't even think about it. But there's this common assumption that we are these active uh, sort of agents that are conceptualizing the world, right? So we project beliefs onto the world. We, we you know, make the world what it is in some way by structuring it with our minds. And there's this whole idea that, you know, what we're doing is the active side of what our relationship with the world is. So one way that I understand what Heidegger's up to is that uh, uh, 
you can understand him to be saying, no, actually, the world shows itself to us, right? The active side of things is largely on the side of reality or being or the world, right? The world is the thing that is showing up for us, right? It's the thing that is is giving us uh, concepts, for example, is one way to look at it. Um, and I think that this is such a uh, sort of wild overturning of so many of our assumptions. You know, you, you look at even in uh, occultism and, and contemporary spiritualism and you know, spirituality and all this stuff. And there's such a uh, unthinking assumption that, yeah, you know, it, what you believe makes the world what it is, right? What you think shapes the world. The way you look at the world makes it show up the way it does. And Heidegger says, well, maybe it is that you think the way you do because of the activity of the world, because the world is showing up on its end in that way. Right? You may have less active control over that than you think. So, I mean, I think that this is really, really seductive, but it's also very difficult. So we get these sort of poetic, mystical, tortured texts that are so enigmatic, so mysterious, that that in and of itself is, is seductive. There is to my way of thinking and understanding, just an undeniable coincidence of both critical approach, interest, and end goals between eco-feminist thinking and the thinking of Heidegger, especially in regards to his interest in dwelling, you know, for human beings upon the earth in harmony with the fourfold. Right, so earth, sky, divinities, and mortals. You know, he speaks very much of the earth itself, you know, a field or a forest, and his concern that this is no longer earth that human beings plant and grow food in, um, or forage from, or dwell within, but rather under this paradigm, all of this has been reduced to mere resources to be optimized. A forest is just X number square foot of lumber. Land is just there to be challenged, to yield these resources that we can stockpile and, you know, use for maximum efficiency. And to me, that just maps right on to one of the biggest aspects of ecofeminist thinking. So there was no way that I could one, deny it, and two, not pursue it. I have always separated a thinker's thinking from their from their biography. I mean, I think you have to do that to a certain extent in order to open yourself to what might be there in their thinking. But at the same time, have the awareness and acknowledgement about the biographical details, etc. I think one thing that is difficult for us is to go back and try to realize how did National Socialism appear in the early 30s before it becomes, you know, how does it appear? How does fascism first start? When do people realize that they're dealing with it? Now, I will admit that you have Karl Jaspers and other German philosophers, not many, frankly, but some saw it much earlier than Heidegger. Frankly, not many did much about it. There were students who lost their lives protesting in Munich and elsewhere, but not many professors. But one thing is, how did fascism appear in the early 30s? Second, is it possible to try to imagine what a political world looks like for someone like Heidegger in the period of the early 30s. On the one hand, you have Soviet Russia and Stalin and gulags and banning of religion and on and on and on. And a very uh, strong military, etc. For a number of reasons, that was seen as a, as a very negative political system. Heidegger's opinion of the West, particularly in the United States, about which he knew relatively nothing in the sense of he had never visited the United States, he had, you know. But from his writings, you can get that this is a consumeristic technological catastrophe, that this is not a viable political option either. 
So you have the sense of, so what is Germany? Is there an alternative between these? And I think Heidegger desperately wanted, among others, is it throwing our lot in with one or the other, or are we trying to create something else? The philosopher Zizek claims, and it's a controversial claim to a lot of people, uh, but claims that Heidegger made the right decision in the 30s, but in the wrong direction. So what Heidegger recognized was that there was something uh, very uh, problematic about the way that sort of modern uh, society was going. You know, he had all these critiques of, of liberal democracy and of capitalism. He doesn't fully develop these. He doesn't write on politics a whole lot. But he has this sense that things are, are, are deeply uh, wrong and he needs some different direction. And the direction he takes is fascism. Uh, Zizak says, listen, he could have just as easily have chosen communism. And that, you know, would have landed him in a very different position, but it could be built consistent with his critiques of society, right? His critique of society doesn't necessitate him going in the fascist direction. It, he could have gone either in the fascist direction or, or you know, in the more socialist or, or, or uh, communist direction. And I think this is true. I think that one reason he ended up in fascism was that he thought that things were, were deeply broken in society, that there was, uh, for example, this aspect of leveling, um, this aspect of loss of meaning, that things were becoming mechanized, that we were being reduced to these isolated and therefore empty individuals, that a lot of this comes from liberal democracy. He saw all of these things that are useful critiques. It's just his solution was was deeply, deeply mistaken. During his Nazi period, right, even during the period where he was, you know, rector of a university, he was officially a member of the Nazi party, you know, he was speaking out in support of the Nazi party, there's a point um, when uh, someone comes to his university and gives a lecture, uh, you know, representing the official Nazi science of, you know, their race science. And he dedicates a whole class meeting of his class to explaining to his students why everything that was said at this lecture was totally wrong and stupid, right? So that was so promising when I stumbled upon that, you know, several years ago. I was like, oh God, here he is. You know, he's, he's critiquing the racism and the anti-Semitism of Nazism. But the problem is, once you look at the Black Notebooks, you realize he was critiquing it because it was based on biology, right? He was critiquing it because the idea was that this is some sort of biological fact. However, it's not wrong from his view to think that there is really important cultural problems with Judaism and so on and so forth. So he has this sort of historicist, intellectual, cultural anti-Semitism rather than a biological anti-Semitism. But that's no better. The way I understand what was going on with Heidegger and fascism is that he went through a very distinct period, starting sometime in the early 30s, ending, I would argue, sometime around 35, 36. He's fascist. And what you see when you look at his philosophy is that key things he had rejected previously and he would reject later, he starts championing during that period. So, for example, he presents the idea that these strong individuals can define and, and change history. So he presents this idea that the great artist, the great political leader, right, of course, we're thinking Hitler here, uh, the, the great thinker and philosopher can project and open up a new future, right, a whole new way of existing. And this is totally in contrast with what he was doing in Being in Time and what he does in, for example, the published version of The Origin of the work of art. So if you look at the 1936 published version of The Origin of the Work of Art, he says, listen, the artist is a conduit, right? A hallway, a passageway through which art itself as an ongoing historical process manifests. And it's art that can open up a world that can shape history, but it's not the artist. The artist has no power over determining what the artwork will be and determining how history will play out. If you look at the earlier versions of the, the origin of the work of art, which were given as lectures, 
during his Nazi period, or what I would consider his Nazi period, he's saying that the great artist can change history and the great artist will open up a new way of life. So he has this huge shift between this uh, sort of heroic idea of a Promethean sort of powerful individual that he then rejects later on, and that was already inconsistent with his earlier thinking. So when it comes to his Nazism, I think that it was a mistake that occurred, perhaps is one way to put it, where he rejects some of his earlier insights. Maybe he gets caught up in, in the sort of thinking of the day or the movement of the day, the passion of the day. Uh, you can see how he would have been tempted to that, and then he realizes the mistake he made. But I think there's a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is, and this isn't yet as widely recognized, I think that his fascism was a passing phase, but his anti-Semitism was not. He was anti-Semitic before he was a fascist, and he was anti-Semitic after he was a fascist, uh, and, and through you know much of his later work. So you think about his critique of technology. Just recently, we, we've had published what are called the sort of infamous black notebooks of Heidegger. And these were notebooks he kept you know throughout World War II, but also throughout some of the, the later period of his thinking. And when you look at that, he connects his critique of technology with these really stupid shallow, you know, obviously uh, false characterizations of what he understood as Jewish thinking and Jewish culture. Um, so there is this deep-seated, consistent anti-Semitism. So I, the, the irony is I think that we can save Heidegger from fascism. Uh, we can, can, in a way, be an apologist for Heidegger's fascism, but I don't think we can save him from anti-Semitism. Regarding Heidegger's, you know, Nazism or his, you know, allegiance to the National Socialist Party, my own understanding of it, you know, which has developed over time and reading other people's thought on this and things like that is we have to, first of all, recognize Heidegger as a human being. And moreover, he's a human being positioned in a particular place and time. And he was interested from what we can come to surmise very much in reforming education and you know part of the unfolding of the whole nazi thing was this promise that was made to him that he would receive the rectorship at freiburg and that he would then be able if you will to reform education from within my take is that he was someone that he saw an opportunity that he held dear, that was personally very important to him, and he saw it as being offered via allegiance to the Nazi party. And, and so that's that's just how I understand it, you know, as a, you know, obviously super, somewhat superficial historical placement of, of that and that decision that he made. Um, and of course, you know, as we now know through various means that, once he began to attain what he was hoping to attain in terms of, you know, official appointments, etc., he himself came under a great deal of scrutiny, and he was even accused of being, quote, Talmudic in his philosophy. So he was accused by Nazis of being too Jewish. And, and so I just think that's, you know, something to take note of. If I were going to dismiss every thinker whoever personally engaged in some kind of politics or worldview that I find personally offensive, I would be left with virtually no one to read. Plato, Aristotle, Kant, all of these thinkers are situated within their given place and time and rampant misogyny and sexism abounds there. And, you know, from the very beginning when I took a philosophy course and, and felt immediately that that was my path. That was just something, you know, I had an awareness of and, and could both appreciate the import of it, you know, and how there's the need to be critical. But at the same time, one of the first things I was taught in philosophy was the principle of charity. That when we read a thinker, we should interpret them as charitably as possible. 
And so when I read Aristotle, Plato, Kant, or whoever else, I, I know the context in which they exist. And, you know, take Nietzsche, for example, t- says some terribly, you know, misogynistic and sexist things. But nonetheless, I find his thinking absolutely brilliant and incredibly valuable. So we can go on and on with the faults of the guy. And I think one of my concerns is that at a certain point, I mean, all of those things led him towards the end of the war to a mental breakdown, to, uh, he had to, he suffered for these things, whether he apologized or not, I think that's clear. And maybe I'm Pollyannish about it, but I think a lot of times, People who make real changes in their thinking have to go through some traumatic events. I mean, I don't think you raise questions about the character of the thinking of an entire culture or cultures unless you begin to see the devastation that that culture has engaged in. But I I think it's a shame if the dislike of his politics and so forth means writing off what he came to think about. I don't mean to be an apologist for him, but I'm just saying it's a shame to take someone at one point in their life and to then discount writing that occurs 10, 15 years later, or in his case, much later. You know, he died in 76. I think blindness at some points in your life can be not only overcome, but can be a means for coming to grips with what's really wrong. By the time World War II came to a close, Heidegger had been withdrawn from both the Nazis and politics in general for a decade. One of his notorious questions after the war was, what did World War II really decide? When someone asks, what did the Second World really decide? You can take it as an insufferable comment by Heidegger. Or you could take it, what looked at from a distance, what did it really decide? Do we act differently, think differently? Are we thinking differently? Are we practicing less revenge? Are we regarding the Earth as something other than a vast pile of resources at our disposal? Given these benchmarks, the Second World War settled very little. Pulled out of this philosophical context, however, the question easily seems shameful. He does that throughout his work. Heidegger often teaches by jolting. So he will say things like that, which take in a certain way, at first blush, they seem utterly insufferable. What did the Second World War really decide? And you're talking to an audience whose town has been destroyed, whose parents have been killed, in a Europe that's devastated, on and on and on. You almost want to scream. Is he blind to that? Or is he saying really the forces that brought us to here, has it really caused us to change them or find alternatives? Or has it just been, we've had this horror, okay, get busy, put on a new set of clothes. We'll have Adenauer and cheer for democracy. Ich würde also sagen, dass auch Menschen, zum Beispiel, wie die Kommunisten, eine Religion haben, nämlich sie glauben an die Wissenschaft. Sie glauben unbedingt an die moderne Wissenschaft. Und diese unbedingte Glaube, das heißt das Vertrauen auf die Sicherheit der Ergebnisse der Wissenschaften, ist ein Glaube und ist in gewissem Sinne etwas, was über den einzelnen Menschen hinausgeht und ist also eine Religion. Und ich würde sagen, kein Mensch ist ohne Religion und jeder Mensch in 
for gods and radicals audiences, you know, you're, you're going to also have to try to deal with his discussion of the fourfold. And so uh, that's where he, he starts talking about gods. And there he starts talking about understanding the world as this unity of the gods or the immortals, the mortals, and heaven and earth. Right? So these four things tied together make a world. And I think that thinking about that uh, can be really useful for the, the gods and radicals audience. He adopts that term, the fourfold, uh, in order to talk about some specific things. My first encounter with it was in the essay, Building Dwelling Thinking, which anybody who's new to Heidegger, I always say, read this essay first. Just go ahead and read this and, you know, read it slowly and read it more than once. And um, if you're attuned, <laughs> you're gonna get a very clear sense of what he's doing. Um, but in the Building Dwelling Thinking, for example, the, the fourfold, first of all, he says, is four, but it is one. It is primarily, primordially one. Yet in our thinking, because we have it parsed out as four, we forget the oneness of the four. Of course, the four are earth, sky, divinities, and mortals. And typically represented as an X, like if you drew an X, you know, and you could put uh, divinities and sky on the top two points, right? And at the end of the diagonal line from divinities, you would put mortals. And at the end or bottom point of that diagonal line from sky, you would put earth. Now in building dwelling thinking, you know, he discusses each of these explicitly to anyone who's already inclined to think about existence as ultimately being interdependent with all other things, you know, whether they happen to be, you know, overtly environmentally minded or not, you know, if they just even have an intuitive or innate understanding that our existence as humans is completely intertwined and interdependent with the health of the earth and the things that live upon it and the movement of the stars, even though, you know, obviously we know that the sun is stationary and we turn and we go, we revolve around it. But all of that is, is mentioned in that particular essay. And moreover, the way in which he speaks of the fourfold is a way in which it is abundantly clear in my view that the particular place of mortals, of human beings, is to harmonize in a mode of acceptance to the functioning of these other three parts of the fourfold. And by harmonizing with that, we can attain to, you know, full dwelling is how I put it in my book, just, you know, full or fuller dwelling. We leave to the weather, for example, its inclemency and its favor. So the idea being that, you know, the mindful, harmonized mortal takes stock of the sky and of the patterns of weather. Is it raining right now or is it not raining? And adapts to it. And that is very different than a technologized sort of capitalist techno-scientific approach to nature, if you will, or weather patterns, where the human as conqueror and dominator uh, says, well, let's see, can't we use science to figure out a way to make nature conform to our desires? Um, and so to me, again, you know, as soon as I'm reading, you know, <laughs> this essay many, many, many years ago, that was some of the first, th you know, first strong strikes of it for me was just that he is talking about a way of existing that arguably has not existed in a very long time, except, you know, in what we would call, you know, so-called primitive people, right? Uh, people who are still, you know, living off the land, if you will, and with the land and the earth. Um, you know, the modern and uh, late modern epoch paradigm in which we exist is one in which all those things, the earth and all upon it, the sky, etc., have become 
mere resources for us to utilize and instrumentalize and you know thus we end up completely out of harmony with it you build your house close to the source of water you don't build your house on the mountain that affords the best vista and then use science and technology to force the water to come to you right you build your house with a roof that's pitched so as to make use of the snow to insulate the inside and provide warmth rather than saying here's how I want my house to be designed and I will extract resources from the earth to you know fuel my house to have the warmth that I demand and desire see it to, to my way of thinking and again I'd been doing environmental ethics at this point for a while uh, it was just such a different vastly different um way to think about how humans ought if you will to be living upon the earth um you know in this harmonious reciprocal relation with all that is afforded to us by you know the fourfold rather than you know our modern late modern scientific technological capitalist <laughs> paradigm in which you know if you have money then you can make whatever demand you wish upon the earth I think for Heidegger to dwell is to belong to something larger than yourself to live in such a way within a place that it's clear that you literally belong such that you appreciate your interdependence with other things I mean dwelling is impossible without interdependence and dwelling seems to be a manner of living which manifests cares for respects that interdependence once you say interdependence it seems to me you've already cast doubt on our characteristic way of living in the world which in the modern terms is it's there so that we can use it how do you go so far as we dwell in it as if we are gods i mean the the the, the world revolves revolves around us that is the polar opposite in some way of dwelling so dwelling relies upon this development this cultivation of of deep sense of interdependence but also dwelling comes down to practical things how do you eat how do you build everyday manners we characteristically live in, in such a way that we don't see our relentless exploitation or we deflect it or we hide it and if we would stop and consider it then then perchance we would begin to see oh we we really are acting like little gods and milking the earth for everything it's worth and where is that getting us and so i think for heidegger this dwelling is how do you put meditative thinking in practice and i think for him it must be because we are shaped by habits and practices it's not just a theoretical activity we are affected by concrete practices very much dwelling is putting that meditative thinking into into how we deal with all the little things and again that's a very old idea you know just having a fine thought about meditative thinking where the hell is that going to get you it's not unimportant but it's it's way down the list i mean i see it in teaching it's fine to have a pedagogy as we like to say it sounds all very theoretical but what really matters is can you shape a space or allow a space to occur that is an alternative to the regular thinking we practice at the same time i was lo- looking for people that i didn't know personally outside of the united states to review my book 
and I encounter I come across a man in France and um, the one thing he said that was so striking, which I, you know, was the kind of thing where you're like, wow, I wish I had thought of that myself, was he was the first one to explicitly bring up to even read Heidegger or consider Heidegger is unsavory because of the Nazism, anti-Semitism. But he said that it is our responsibility to look for that, which is, this, and these are his words, most healthy within Heidegger's thinking so that we can transform taboo into totem and put to use the, the part of Heidegger's thinking that is so unique, exquisite, brilliant, groundbreaking, if you will. Und existiert, indem er dem Sein entspricht. 